Hello, everybody. Welcome, guys, You're here in, the, in person. I'm um, very excited to be here tonight presenting to you and online. I want to thank Engineers Island for the opportunity. Um, it's great to meet fellow colleagues in the industry and talk about something that I'm quite passionate about, electronic actuation, and share some of the stories and uh, projects that we, we work on. Bit of formality regarding this presentation tonight. I don't want it to be a sales pitch. I want it to be a learning opportunity for yourself and for me as well. So I encourage questions at the end. And we will also be doing a live demonstration for the people that's in the room. And uh, Michal has kindly organized some remote um, viewing of this demonstration, which is going to be nice. Kicking off. My first slide introduction. I am an electronic engineer. I've done my honors in mechanical engineering and I worked mainly in the oil and gas industry in South Africa, where I was an end user for REXA. We had REXA installed on our critical turbine applications, controlling speed. And as you can imagine, safety is an important part of this type of application. And after that, I moved to Ireland because of love. <laughs> and I uh, worked in the system integrated uh, business, mainly in the pharmaceutical industry here in Ireland, working mainly with Siemens gear, but we looked at all different types of um, PLCs. And then there's that old saying that you should never burn your bridges. Well, Rexa came full circle and um, I was approached to head up the sales in the UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia region, um, um, promoting the product and uh, working on applications in the oil and gas, mining and minerals, power generation, and wastewater industries. I've been with them for about one year now, and uh, these are some of the photos of what I've been up to. So the top right, my top right, let me get my laser pointer, this was our fancy installation on a gas loop in Norway, um, on shore. To the left of that is me and a very experienced service engineer called Mark Garza. We did the installation in the equipment room there. This is my partner in Norway, Jani. Um, he helps me, he's our channel partner there. As you can see, Norway is a very cold place. I'm often walking around in snow. Uh, Big change for a guy from South Africa, which is very warm. And then one that was a great opportunity and uh, I really enjoyed was at the Norwegian Technical University. We have an actuator installed on a compressor application in the wet gas multi-phase lab. And this was a student and uh, the lab technician, Eric. Um, we had some interesting times getting test data and pushing the equipment to the limit. Like I said, I want this presentation to be informative. So I'm gonna talk about actuation types. I'm gonna make correlation to the human factory. Try keep things practical and simple. I mean, um, not too technical here. I compare electronic actuation to a knockout punch. I'm gonna talk about different applications and the concept of the hidden factory. In the, in the Engineers Island Flyer, I um, talked about this concept of the hidden factory and I'll explore it more in case studies. And then right at the end, we will crack an egg, which is my party trick when it comes to uh, uh, electronic actuation. First up, a valve and the actuator. I want to explain the difference now. You will find that a lot of the times it gets bundled together. People just refer to the valve. The actuator is sometimes classified as an accessory um, to the valve, but I really want to separate these two pieces of equipment, right? The valve is the part at the body, uh, sorry, the part at the bottom that has a body and a flange that connects to the pipes and it has a bonnet, which typically 
the caters for an actuator to mount on top of. An actuator would have a yoke, a coupling that connects to the stem and some sort of power source, which I'll elaborate more on later. A valve, simplistically, is a variable orifice, right? So by changing this, the position of the stem, you are changing the size of this orifice, which is creating a pressure drop in the fluid flowing through it. And this is how you are regulating a process, you know, a process variable, uh, whether it's a slurry from a mine or a gas from a, uh, uh, an undersea well. So when we explore actuation and the human body, we can draw some similarities. This is going more into the instrumentation space. You know, when I talk about process variables, we need to be able to measure and sense them. We have eyes, we have ears as a human. What are we sensing in the process? Pressure, flow, temperature. We think about these measurements in our brain or the control system, and we take action on an error where we will send a control signal to some sort of device that's gonna do work, right? In the human body, it, you know, it's, it's our muscle. It's the crane that's picking up. In the process, it's an actuator. Actuator is the muscle that's doing the work to control the process variable in question. This poster was from a Chinese medical uh, forum and uh, I liked it. So it explains the concept which I'm trying to get to. So looking at a instrumentation loop, back again, here's my level measurements. I'm controlling the level in the tank. We have a control system that's gonna regulate that level. And that signal that's been sent to the muscle, the actuator, you know, it can be 40, 20 milliamps with heart superimposed. We can support also a variety of field buses when it comes to this type of equipment. This diagram was from the Australian pipeline uh, manufacturer, and it's just here to show how many valves there are in industry. I mean, we've got manual valves, globe valves, check valves, diaphragm valves, safety valves, swing, needle, butterfly, globe, uh, ball. But what I want to focus on is what's highlighted here in my galaxy pen, and uh, it's control valves. And electronic actuation focuses on the critical control valves, the ones that unlock some sort of benefit, has a business case, um, to improve the control and unlock um, benefit. Manual valves is open and closed. You know, we're not looking at these type of valves. We're looking at control valves. So just keep that in mind. Then the second part, the part on top of the valve, the actuator, we've got different types as well. We have pneumatic actuators, electrical actuators, and hydraulic actuators. Hydraulic using oil, electrical, typically having a motor driving a gearbox. When we come to electronic actuation, which is quite unique, um, we have different types, linear, rotary, and drive. Linear will be up and down. Rotary will be creating a torque. And a drive you will typically find in dampeners or linkage arrangements around a turbo machinery, inlet guide vanes, for example. So electronic actuation, I'm a, I'm a big fan of boxing. Right? I, not only is it a good source of exercise, um, it's a type of sport that the more you work you put in, the more you get rewarded. Right? And um, it's a great humbling experience climbing into the ring with your opponents. It's a good social equalizer. So this is my little coach back in South Africa. And... Um, Taking a slow mo punch from a heavyweight or like myself. And what I'm drawing conclusions here is what makes a knockout punch, right? What, what are we looking for? We're looking for power, right? It needs to be speed, it needs to be fast. 
to hit the target. It needs to be accurate. I mean, this target can be moving and it needs to be repeatable. These are some performance characteristics that you would need on critical applications, just like that knockout boxing punch. So when we look at actuators, obviously there are some limitations with the ones that I've mentioned. And I'm just gonna talk briefly through this. When you're looking at pneumatic type of actuation, it's working on air and air as a, is a gas, it's compressible. And if you're trying to control movements with something that's squidgy like a sponge, you're gonna get bad sort of positioning performance out of, out of a pneumatic actuation. Electrical, like I said, had a motor with a gearbox. This gearbox can have whiplash, which affects the accuracy and positioning, and also susceptible to vibration and failures. On one of the installations, we had an um, uh, electrical actuator installed 20 feet up in the pipeworks uh, of a process plant. It was installed on a downstream pipe from a compressor. And this actuator had failed because a lot of vibrations on the skid and the actuator failed at a 20% opening. And this caused a downtime and maintenance crew had to come in and fix it because you could not run the machine with the, with the, with the discharge isolated. Um, and then hydraulic on the right, often seen as big skids that have a reservoir that the oil communicates to atmosphere. This oil can get contaminated. So you have filters. These filters are maintenance items. Um, you need a pump to continuously maintain the pressure on this hydraulic skid. And often when I go and survey these type of skids, they come standard with the oil pan underneath because of the, the, the maintenance and the failures that they have. It's, it, there's a constant oil leak. When it comes to electrolytic actuation, you combined all the benefits of these paradigms of actuation technologies into one. You throw away the pneumatic disadvantage. You have the speed from a servo or stepper motor in this case, and the hydraulic oil is self-contained. We're looking at a coffee cup of oil in the power module. And this in a, in a packaged unit gives us the speed, accuracy, and repeatability that I was talking about when it comes to boxing. And obviously you know, on your critical applications, you know, in industry, they are harsh environments, they dirty, robust and reliable um, is what you need standard. So yeah, I have a electrolytic actuation example. It's the dampener actuator with the spring fail closed. And um, this, actu this fire dampener closes if there's a fire in the vicinity of the building or uh, offshore rig, and it needs to close very quickly. And obviously tight shut off is important in this scenario because you do not want dangerous toxic gases going through this vent. So let's see if this video plays where I can show you. So that dampener closed in the second. I'll play it again for the guys online. It closed in the second and it has tight shut off due to that hydraulic driving force. This was a project I was working on recently in Norway. Um, it was um, very fun to, to be fatting the system, you know. I think that's one benefit of working for EXA. It's not pure, pure you know, sales calls. It's, it's a lot of engineering and problem solving, which is, which is great. And, I mean, the applications are many, right? Many, many, many applications. This critical control 
um, in a lot of a lot of places out there. And I'm not going to go through all of them, right? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to focus on my favorites. Obviously, rotating equipment uh, would be one because that was my speciality. And uh, obviously, like I said, on the steam governor valves and anti-surge valves, these are great applications um, for good uh, actuation. And another favorite of mine is the wastewater industry. Um, being an avid fisherman, I like the idea of clean water. And uh, coming from a very dry country like South Africa, it's a natural resource that I really think we need to preserve. So one of my favorite applications and industries is the wastewater. Now I would like to come back to this concept of the hidden factory and how do we unlock it? Now, I think what it means to me, you know, your factory has a baseline that it operates in, maybe an upper and lower limit. There could be somewhere or a region that you could operate in, but you never seem to get there. Let's call that the hidden factory. What is stopping you from achieving the hidden factory? There could be loads of things that are formed under the tip of the iceberg, right? Just some things that came to mind when I was brainstorming energy, right? Today's topics, energy is high up there. You'll be generating a lot of waste. There could be maybe a safety concern in your process um, that's limiting your production. You could have Bad process control. Can you imagine a massive steam or pure gas header that has a 5% swing due to pneumatics? This is um, um, a lost, lost revenue, essentially, in the process. Unplanned downtime due to um, failures, resource constraints, it could even be people, environmental issues, legislation, if you are um, emitting um, you know, through a stack, or what am I, uh, there's a word for that. Um, emissions, that's what I'm trying to say. Emissions, right? You know, I mean, these, 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 there are some very strict um, emission standards out there. You, you know, you, it's frowned upon in some, in, in some communities as well. You know, if you have to rework something in a, in a, in a automotive plant, I mean, that's a type of wastage or, uh, hidden factory that you can unlock. Even a bottleneck could be somewhere in your process or using the wrong technology for the job. These are all things, you know, that levers that you can pull to move these upper limits and start going to the hidden factory that you might have not known that you've had. And this is where I come to my case studies where I'm gonna try explain just some of the hidden factories that I've seen um, looking at a, boiler feed water system. So this is a cool experiment if you guys are at home. If you're ever boiling a kettle of water and you take a cold cup of water and add it to that kettle, the steam generation falls away completely. You can, you can test this. And same is the case. The similarity is here in a big process where you have a boiler generating high pressure steam that's supplying a turbine that's generating electricity. This electricity could be for your process or it could be exported to your national grid during peak demand maybe, which is generating a lot of income for your company, if that's the case. So this process that I'm gonna explain here has three uh, horizontal centrifugal pumps in parallel configuration sucking water from a suction tank it has a recycle line back to the water tank. And depending on the steam demand, you either run one pump, two pumps, or three. One pump could have a VSD even. So it's having a bit of a, a bigger curve that it can operate in. And depending on how these pumps are running, you're maintaining this level in the drum. And if you're adding too much water or too little water, you're affecting the steam generation. Right? If you have a pneumatic actuator here, you might be getting a response that looks like this, okay? Overshoot, undershoot, adding too much water, adding too little water, not adding water quick enough when there's a disturbance, that's a delay. These are things that are affecting your steam generation, which is affecting your electricity production, which is your hidden factory. 
if you're not producing at an optimal point, if you're not producing enough steam when you need it on demand, this is a hidden factory that you might want to unlock. Case study two, oil terminal. A lot of applications on an oil terminal, but let's imagine we've got a refinery on the coast. There's a long jetty into the sea. The ships come and offload oil, or liquid petroleum, gas. And on this oil jetty, you might not have instrumentation air or electrical might be a problem. So there's some limitations in the technology you can use there. You know, maybe there's some safety involved. You need to emergency shut down. I mean, we know oil and gas is flammable. If there's an incident, you need to shut down. How do you shut down an electrical actuator that is a gearbox that when you pull away the power, it fails in place, right? You would need some sort of spring or accumulator system to shut the valve down. So that's, that's talking about the, the safety side, but let's look at the hidden factory again. Let's, let's, let's pull back to the hidden factory. Let's look at the metering. So you have these flow meters that are taking fuel from the ship and offloading it into the tanks. And these flow meters are calibrated for a very specific range. And that is the range you need to be transferring this fuel across. If you're not sending one liter across and measuring one liter, there could be losses, right? And these losses can add up over time, over millions of liters that you're transferring. And um, another example of a hidden factory. My third case study, this is the water industry. Um, on filters, you know, water, wastewater industry has uh, filters, effluent filters that are controlling the turbidity, usually a large butterfly valve. And a butterfly valve has a quick opening characteristic, right? So it can be a bit hard to control. Having that precise movement capability, you can unlock good control opportunities out of these type of applications, and you can reduce these turbidity spikes. Where does the hidden factory come? Well, if you stop a turbidity spike or pass through on these filters, you don't have to add extra chemical dosing and chemical dosing costs a lot of money. And that is savings that you, you unlock. Well, I actually got a, another case study, case study four. Okay, compressors, my favorite. So um, compressor map, I don't know if, how many of you guys are familiar with this. You know, you've got uh, flow on the X axis, pressure on the Y. Um, this red line is your surge control line. Let's call it the, the safety, safety line. You've got the surge control line, which is the green. And the goal here is to keep this operating point, which is this plus sign over here, to keep the operating point away from surge. So a lot of the times the safety margin here could be 20%, 10%, I don't know, 30%, depends. And if you can op expand this operating envelope because you have a fast actuation response, this, this equates to a hidden factory, savings in money, because it means you can operate the machine at a pressure that you couldn't have in the past. For example, if this green line was sitting over here, my operating point can move safely over here and work and control. You know, it could be even more efficiently operating if it's in this point, which is energy savings, another form of hidden factory. So compressor dynamic control, a great application for good actuation technology. Then one for the road. I know I might be a bit trendy here, but I, I, I tend to have the same values as Engineer Island, right? You know, continuous development, learning new things. I really believe as engineers, we should keep our skills sharp. And uh, one thing that's trending a lot on social media right now is this open AI and chat GPT, which is, let's call it it, it's the, it's the machine. And I decided to ask the machine, what makes a good valve actuator? And he, he kind of agreed with me, man. He, he said accuracy and precision, reliability, speed and responsiveness. And he also mentioned a few other good things compatibility and flexibility on your applications, safety and security, 
energy efficiency and ease of use and maintenance. So definitely a good tool. You know, for some people, it's a bit controversial. Um, but that's that's how I want to <laughs> leave you guys tonight. It also kind of validates what I'm saying, I suppose. <laughs> right. Now I would like to move over to the live demonstration. Once again, thank you, Engineers Island, for the opportunity. Um, before we do the live presentation, I, I, I want to explain this rig and take some questions, obviously. Uh, but this rig that we have here is called a profiler rig. And we use it when you want to do a head-to-head -head comparison between actuation technologies. And we also use it, um, this little laptop we take to rigs if you need to monitor the performance of uh, a valve, you know, diagnostics. So that's just a bit about that. If you're ever wondering what this rig is here, yeah? And then in my live demonstration, I'm going to crack an egg and I put the one ton mark here because this actuator is gonna generate 2000 pounds of force, which equates to an imperial ton. So being a boy from South Africa, I like to think of an elephant standing on an egg, right? This is what I'm going to be doing now, controlling the elephant onto the egg and cracking it ever so lightly. All right, so there we have movement. Just to explain a bit um, about the demo, we've got an electronic subassembly and a mechanical subassembly. The electronic subassembly uh, is, is being powered by a normal office supply, 220 volts, but we can do 110 or even 24 volts. These are handy for remote installations. The electronic actuator has a power module that has a motor connected to it. This motor can be changed depending on the speeds that you need. And the oil sits in here, right? The oil sits in here and it's a coffee cup of oil. We've got a positioner that's giving you a feedback that you can send back to the DCS. If you want to marry your control signal and your feedback signal, and this is the cylinder that we move the hydraulic oil from one side to the other. And the valve will connect to the end of this coupling, right? We don't have a valve in this scenario, but I want to show you first this knockout punch that I was talking about earlier. So let's, this is a little spot price. I think I'm going to ask someone here in the audience. What, what are the three, well, give me four performance specs that, that make a good actuator. So the responsiveness, responsiveness, or compatibility, yeah, flexibility, yeah, and so flexibility and reliability. FPVC <laughs> is what I'm talking about. Think, think one. No, no, you understand, right? Definitely. It's also the think about the punch, right? The speed, it's the power, it's the accuracy, the repeatability. So here's an egg for you to remember me. Right, stress. Do you ever stress it? You're stressing that this thing is going to pop the egg. <laughs> All right, so let's let's simulate speed. Okay, speed from here to there to there. We're looking at a dead time of 80 milliseconds. Okay. Let's look at accuracy. It's my business card. Okay, this is a thousandth of an inch gauge. Okay. So one gradient on this um, gauge is like a thickness of a human hair. Okay. So let's put my, let's mark this. Okay. Let's, let's first put 10 about and my milliamps. So I'm sending 12 milliamps down here. Okay. 12 milliamps. Here. So I put my business card in here and we move 10 deviations, right? And I said that one deviation is a thousand of an inch. If I slip my business card into here, that's 10,000 of an inch, okay? So we're controlling to that point. They are marking it. 
I'm giving 12 milliamps. I'm going to go up to 20 milliamps. Okay, back to 12. Turn it off. Do it again. A little bit off. Right? Let's move it over. Could be. All right. Let's try that again. In application terms, this is like going from I suppose open to close. Right? No, no, this is going from from in under it could be open to close, but that doesn't help if we want to be controlling. So let's let's remember that boiler example I was explaining. Let's say your optimal is at 57 point something percent, you're generating the best steam for your energy export. Um, you want to be able to hit that mark every time. So that's the repeatability and the accuracy. The repeatability is me being able to hit that mark every time. And uh, obviously it's the accuracy is, is a function of the full span, depending on the emission you travel, right? So open and close in the application, like the, the station. No, it's you want the 56 point definitely, seven rather than definitely. Yeah. Remember my galaxy pin that I, I so called yeah. the valves, it was the control valves that we're looking at, right. the ones that modulate and control the process. We do install on all of the applications, but these are the ones with big safety requirements. So that is the, the fire damper, for example. For example, damper. or turbine overspeed, you need to trip, for example. Okay. You have situations where um, the spring needs to fail within a certain amount of time, and um, maybe sulfury capable. No, these applications, sole applications, we do. Okay. okay. So I've showed speed, I've showed repeatability, and I've shown accuracy. I would like to show now um, the scenario with an egg. So I'm going to take me back up to 20 milliamps. So that is open. And how I do this test, um, I calibrate on my electronic subassembly a new low position. Okay. So you can watch me do this. Um, I go into calibrate mode. Currently, my position low is 8%. I'm going to set a new low position, which is just a hairline crack in my head. Maybe we should swap sides and you can see nicely. So, it takes a bit of time. So, I'm manually moving this now. Right? This has auto manual setup mode. Where Waiting to hear the kick to the crack, right? Good. Can you see it? Sometimes I like to, for the video, if you can see where the crack is, I'm going to go a little bit more. I mean, it's very fine movement, right? So I'm going to go a little bit more just so we can see a bit of a crack on the edge. That's actually forming on the side. Never cracks where I want it to. <laughs> Should be techniques. Actually, if you come from this side, you can see it nicely in the, in the back. I'll go a little bit more just to emphasize that. Can you see it there? Um, yes, can you see it? Guys, come look. <laughs> it's on the corner there. It's showing the light. You see the crack there? Good, uh, yeah, it's a small one. You see that small little crack? All right. That's my new position low. Okay. See the crack over there? So I'm saving that as my position low, my position high. Oh, we can move that. That's it. Okay. So I'm giving 20 milliamps. Let's go back into auto mode. 
you open up completely. And if I have done my engineering calibration right, when I scan this close, we're not making fried eggs, okay? Cold fried eggs. We should be, we should just be making a small little crack. Thumbs. Right, let's see. Have a look. Are we generating the same amount of crack? I just joke, right? <laughs> well, yeah, the crack looks mighty. Uh, yeah, it's there. Let me see if I can bring it open and close it again. So that's this thing is generating 2,000 pounds of force. It's the smallest electronic actuator that we have. And it's imagine that elephant foot crack being controlled so ever precisely onto the top of that egg. It's quite something to think about, you know, egg being nature's most delicate creation and being able to ever so slightly crack it with ever so much force. Any questions? Is it actually even when you were doing it there with the we did the uh, the exact mode of commission thing? Is that yeah. would be similar to I'm sorry, so to yeah, and you're having the bags, so yeah, like, oh no, it's time for so uh, testing. If we're doing a retrofit on a installation in the field, um it will be one of the first steps we do. Obviously, we have to mount the physical actuator, and then you would need to calibrate the load high position, something you do once. Mm -hmm. When you run that, and then you're getting your signal. Remember, my 40 mil 20 milliamp loop calibrator is simulating a PLC or DC signal, analog signal. Something I never touched on, but is quite popular nowadays um, with predictive maintenance and monitoring the equipment. You can imagine, you know, if you're building an offshore rig that is unmanned, you know, you need to be able to monitor um, certain key parameters. So these are two pressure transmitters, kind of the same what we're reading on the gauges. And uh, we can send this information back via field bus technology. And this could give you some sort of diagnostics, depending what parameters. I think, look, we generate codes that monitor in here. There's about a thousand bytes of information in different things. And uh, all that information we would pass on in a field bus um, scenario. And certain of these parameters would be leading indicators and lagging indicators. So lagging would mean, you know, it's after the fact that there's a failure. But the leading ones are quite interesting because it can give you information on a possible uh, upset or uh, failure. Right? So that's 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 nice. If you know some of these um, uh, companies, you have teams dedicated to uh, condition-based maintenance and uh, um, 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 advanced monitoring. You can imagine the type of equipment that's installed are uh, very expensive, critical parts of process. Uh, if your USB is going to be the precision of the exit topometer for the data, everybody can just kind of just do it yeah. once here. And yeah. it so we would, we would measure the type of thrust. Remember, this is connected to the valve. You're generating thrust. If there's a trend, you know, in, in force that's required to close or open, you need that. You need or maybe the, um, um, something starting to fail. Maybe um, you'll find that when on those control valves, I didn't show it so nicely, but you have the valve stem. Around the valve stem is packing, and that packing stops gas from coming out. And a lot of the times. People do audits and they inspect the, the sealing capabilities of the valve. And um, what happens is um, if there's leaks and you can't shut down to repair the valve, the operators would tighten the packing, keep on tightening the packing to make sure there's no leaks coming out of the valve. But what does that start doing to the actuator, right? It's, it starts loading because now it has to overcome more friction. Um, when, when, you, when you're looking at hydraulics, um, that's not a problem. We've got enough power in the drive frame to move through that. If you're looking at pneumatics now, if you're tightening something more friction, now you've got that sponge effect that's over um, 
stress, if I can call it that. You know? <laughs> it's it's before it's it's already overshooting, undershooting. Now it's got to deal with so much more. Yeah. And not to forget, you know, if you manufacturing air to to control your plant, I mean, air isn't cheap. Air needs has a certain requirement. It needs to be dry. It needs to be clean. And if there's filters that all work endpoints, you know, if there's leaks in the instrument airlines, I mean, there's been studies where guys have um, done business cases and cost analysis or how much the compressed air is costing the company to generate. Leakages, you know, um, cause it's not ideal. It's another form of hidden factory, if you think about it. One more for me, if that's okay. Yeah. But it's just you mentioned as well about the uh, in the size of the amount of forest that's coming out. So I suppose at what scale or what size are we start looking at these actuators? You because you're saying this one can provide this is the smallest one, I think. Small you have the amount that I can, yeah, that it can provide. So at what scale do you start seeing the applications of the market at for the electronic uh for the actuators? So the, these these we call this one our vanilla ice cream. So it's it's two inch stroke. Um, 2,000 pounds, I mean, a lot of applications. Um, we, just to answer, where, where would you see? It depends. The valves, the applications are different. Sorry, to bring that to me, like I'm looking at now, it's motorized cap, for example. Oh, okay. on, on, okay. Even on, like, on air systems. Okay. I work more in buildings. I, I know you. your applications, right? So I know your fire damage yeah. and that excites me more. But as to uh, what scale and what, you know, yeah, sure, you know sure. I'm not going to be going putting this on, I suppose, or even. You know, no. No, no, you have to look at it. You have to look. It's this type of actuation is suited for let's call it niche applications, the critical ones with that type of performance and reliability that comes in the package makes sense. You know? It's it's you would need to have a good business case. So I'm not the applications with pneumatic conventional door actuators are you're not installing this on the door. It is it is an actuator. But it'll be super open yeah, for that application. So a lot of um, a lot of the application and knowledge um, it's quite specialized and being able to identify what's going to be a good fit. You know. So that fire dampener, um, you know, you can imagine um, that dampener we had to actually burn. Oh, yeah. Burn the whole thing to shreds. And they wanted to make sure that it failed safe. You know, it's been burnt to a crisp, and um, it did fail safe. So that that's probably the criticality aspect or the safety aspect there. But on a normal building, maybe not. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to say if you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. And um, so. there's one from the online audience. How yes. would you rate the actuator? Rate. Rate. Okay. Uh, can you elaborate a bit more? Uh, the rate, uh, how, is this? how do you rate actuators? That's all I have on from whoever else and asked the question. So, okay, how would you rate? Um, I, I, I you know because because you know the, the definitely the linear ones or the rotary ones, and, and this could be one of the types of rating, the other could uh -huh. be on the sensibility of the, of the mechanism, like you know, you show the precision in, in this particular device yeah uh, there might be other devices which are not required to be as precise to yes to... yes no it will be it like i said the niche market it's 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 more topic right so uh, uh i think when i say critical applications those are the most demanding mm. right and demanding are the ones where you get that hidden factory that business case yeah. that benefit to install it Maybe let's say 10% of the applications is looking at it. The ones that you know, speak to some of the case studies that I did. Anybody else? Is there ever a case for you that you could not retrofit retrofit uh, the actuator or already the valve? Um, not that I know of. A valve has a top works. And usually every every application we do, you know, there's a certain amount of engineering that gets done to fit that top works for that engines. From my understanding, there shouldn't be a problem. And if there is a special adapter or 
or yolk for the actuator that you did the diamond yeah. oh. There's certain things that are standard for the products, but um, there's a lot of customization for this sort of stuff, right? Because every compressor, every yeah. turbine has different spaces. Sometimes our field engineers, they get quite fancy with these 3D scanners. So when the part of them making the drawing package, they get a bit of a overview of where the things are going to put. There's tools that you can use to help with that sort of engineering. We have another one in from online. Oh, yeah. Um, what is the limitation of the valve size for the actuators? And is this similar to the AUMA technology? AUMA? ALMA. All right. So ALMA would be a good scenario of an electrical actuator, right? Um, the valve sizes, I mean, it's big. We've, we've made actuators. I'm not going to lie now, but I think it's 250,000 pounds of, of force from, from 2000 to, let's say, 200 to 250,000 pounds of force. Um, we're doing rotary, right? Big ball valves. Big butterfly valves, we're doing linear, and obviously linkages, uh, which would be the drive type of actuator um, on dampeners and um, inlet guide vanes. So I hope that answers the question. It's not, it's not in the space of electrical, it's unique electronic, which you can think of a mixture between hydraulic and electrical, right? Think of it as the hydraulic is the drivetrain giving you the power. The electrical is giving you the speed and the precision that you need. And we're getting away from all the limitations of pneumatics. Just saying that, because uh, these are the actuators as well themselves, is there a limitation as opposed to the diameter of the valve? The, the valve is separate. No, so the, yeah. So you can, you it, can put it on a. 20 millimeter valve to a- Oh yeah, different inches, I get you, yeah. yeah. So valves, there's valves that have different bonnet dimensions. We call this top works, right? Mm -hmm. So let me explain this a bit more in detail. You've got a valve um, with a different stroke length. So depending on the stroke length, you can have a two inch, four inch. Now we change the cylinders to give you your stroke inch that you need and we calibrate in that range. All right, so that's stroke length. Then. When you're sizing the actuator, you need the force, the brake force to open and force to close. You know, if you have a fail spring in place, you know, that, that needs to be considered. We do the sizing for that as well. So what we need is the top works of the valve and all the rest uh, we, we handle with our engineering department. Uh, there's one more in here. Uh, is that a gas compressor control valve? Is that a gas control valve has to operate very quickly? How fast will the valve stem move in practice? Oh man, that's that's such a good question. So on anti-surge, like you said, gas gas valve. Who was who was that? <laughs> Charles, Charles Smith. Charles Smith. Man, I need to come visit you. Right? <laughs> you you're a good customer, man. Where are you? Where are you? Is you where's he working? Mayo. Mayo. Okay. Yeah. So on. <laughs> <laughs> so so um compressors yes oh man this speed is important so the one that we had at the the norwegian technical university was was tripping open right on anti-surge valves you have to you have to fail open in okay depends what spec well if you're looking at the triple c compressor control spec it's saying under two seconds or under a second well anyway we we're beating that we were, we, were, we were tripping in 600 milliseconds, right? On an eight, how much stroke was that? It was an eight inch, six inch stroke valve. So that's fail open. You detect surge or there's a shutdown, you need to fail open. So 600 milliseconds. And then on a controlled open to close, um, not with the spring, we were, we were doing that under two seconds. I think when I did my measurements, it was coming in at 1.8 seconds from open to close. And obviously there's no dead, not a lot of dead time. The speed of response is there. Um, so you you are regulating that 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 search control quite nicely. I hope that answers um, 